Hallelujah and blessings in King Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Be Ye Holy Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we're continuing our study on Love Not the World by Watchman Nee. And it is no coincidence that we are at the same time doing a review in the book of James, because in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 4, we are told that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Now, as you'll remember in our last time together in this series, we had discussed the difference in the world as it's used in the King James Bible. We have the world as the physical earth. We have the world as the people of earth. And then we have the world as we live in. And so it's important that we differentiate between the meaning of the word world used in the King James Bible when we discuss certain passages and texts. Now, in 1 John chapter 4, John kind of describes what James is illustrating when he says, if we are a friend of the world, the system of the world, then we're an enemy of God. Why? Because in 1 John chapter 2, it says, love not the world, the system of the world, the ruler behind this world's system, which would be Satan. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And now we go back to James chapter 4, verse 4, and it says, Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Why? Because God is not a friend of this world as far as the world system. Remember, there are three ways of using the world. The people of the world, the world as a system which is driven by Lucifer, which will result in the final outcome of Antichrist taking power over the earth in opposition to God. And then we have the world as the physical earth. Well, God created the earth, so obviously he loves the earth. He created the people of the earth, and he offers his love to the people of the earth. But he loves nothing about Satan and Satan's agenda. And it is that agenda that we are speaking of here. We are not to be a part of this world system, a part of progressiveness, because progressiveness wants to leave the old things behind and progress to a newer way, thinking that it's a better way. And of course, we know that that's not true. That's why God tells us constantly to turn back, turn around, go back to the old ways, the simple ways. Because progressiveness is what Lucifer, Satan, is seeking, and that's where he wants to take man, and God wants us to repent and return to his original ways that were established in the Garden of Eden, but very early on in the history of man through the law that was given to Moses and other such laws and commandments, decrees, warnings that were given to the prophets throughout the Old Testament. Now, with that being said, I trust that you are feeling blessed in Jesus, that you're excited to go into chapter 2 of Love Not the World by Watchman Nee to see what it is that we would learn today. So let us begin with chapter 2, which is titled, The Trend Away from God. Every one of us, having been in bondage to sin, we readily believe that sinful things are satanic. But do we believe equally that the things of the world are satanic? Many of us, I think, are still of two minds about this. Yet how clearly Scripture affirms that the whole world lieth in the evil one. And we read of this in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. Now Satan well knows that generally speaking, to try to ensnare real Christians through things that are positively sinful is vain and futile. They will usually sense the danger and elude him. So he has contrived instead an enticing network, 
the mesh of which is so skillfully woven as to entrap the most innocent of men. We flee sinful lust, and with good reason. But when it comes to such seemingly innocuous things as science and art and education, how readily do we lose our sense of values and fall a prey to his enticements? Yet our Lord's sentence of judgment clearly implies that everything that constitutes the world is out of line with God's purpose. His words when he said, now is the judgment of this world, clearly imply the condemnation of all that goes to make up the cosmos. Again, that's K-O-S-M-O-S. -O -S. And it would never have been uttered if there were not something radically amiss with the cosmos. Further, when Jesus goes on by saying, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. He is stressing not merely the intimate relation between Satan and the world order, but the fact that its condemnation is linked with his. Do we acknowledge that Satan is today the prince of education and the prince of science and the prince of culture and the prince of arts and that they with him are doomed? Do we acknowledge that he is the effective master of all those things that together make up the world system? When mention is made of a dance hall or a nightclub, our reactions as Christians is one of instinctive disapproval. To us, that is the world in its very definition. When, however, to go to the other extreme, medical science or social service are discussed, there may be no such reaction at all. These things command our tacit approval and maybe our enthusiastic support. And between these extremes, there lies a host of other things varying widely in their influence for good or bad, between which none of us would probably agree on where to draw an exact line. Yet, let us face the fact that judgment has been pronounced by God not upon certain selected things that belong to this world, but impartially upon them all. Test yourself. If you venture into one of these approved fields, and then someone exclaims to you, you have touched the world there, will you be moved? Probably not at all. It takes someone whom you really respect to say to you very straightly and earnestly, brother, Sister, you have become involved with Satan there. They would have to say this to you before you will so much as hesitate. Is that not so? How would you feel if anyone said to you, you have touched education there, or you have touched medical science there, or you have touched commerce? Would you react with the same degree of caution as you would if he had said, you have touched the devil there? If we truly believe that whenever we touch any of these things that constitute the world, we touch the prince of this world, then the awful seriousness of being in any wise involved in worldly things could not fail to strike home to us. The whole world lieth in the evil one. Not a part of the world, but the whole world. That's what the scripture tells us. Do not let us think for a moment that Satan opposes God only by means of sin and carnality in men's hearts. He opposes God by means of every worldly thing. Oh, I agree with you that the things of the world are all in one sense material, lifeless, intrinsically without power to harm us. Yet even that itself should suggest that they are resistant to the purpose of God as indeed is everything in which there is no touch of divine life. The recurring phrase, after its kind in Genesis 1, represents a law of reproduction that governs the whole realm of biological nature. It does not, however, govern the realm of the spirit. For generation after generation, human parents can beget children after their kind. But one thing is certain, 
Christians cannot beget Christians. Not even where both parents are Christians will the children born to them automatically be Christians. No, not even in the first generation. It will take a fresh act of God every time. And this principle applies no less truly in the affairs of mankind more widely. All that belongs to human nature continues spontaneously. All that belongs to God continues only for as long as God's working continues. And the world is all inclusively that which can continue apart from divine activity. That is, which can go on by itself without the need of specific acts of God to maintain it in freshness. The world and all that belongs to the world does this naturally. It is its nature. And in doing so, it moves in a direction contrary to the will of God. This statement we shall now seek to illustrate both from the scripture and from Christian experience. Now, before we continue, let me say one thing. It was our Lord Jesus that said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles a man. It's what comes out of a man that defiles a man. Because what comes out comes from the heart. That's why we're told that God changes our hearts. He takes the old heart of stone out of us and he gives us a heart of flesh. So now we desire to do the things that God wants us to do as opposed to just simply doing what we think God wants us to do with no desire or passion involved. You see, that's the difference between religion and relationship. Religion follows a set of orders with no passion in adhering to those orders, to those laws. Whereas in a relationship, we are doing everything we can to please our significant other. And in this case, our significant other would be the most significant other, the Lord Jesus himself. So let us be reminded, as we spent much time over the last year focusing upon the issues of the heart, Watchman Nee and these two passages that we're speaking of in James 4.4 4 and 1 John chapter 2 are dealing specifically with what takes place through our body, our habits, our practices, our choices. And there's two distinct differences between the heart and the actions. Now, while it is true that the actions are a fruit of of what's taking place in the heart, the heart being the root that has produced the fruit, still both of these issues are very significant in the Christian life. And let us be careful not to place all our significance on the heart, but not our actions, or contrary, all our actions, but not our heart. But let us stand in the balance and have a combination of both. God dealing with our heart and changing us from the inside out, and us adhering to self-discipline, self-denial, and obedience with much effort to do what we know that it is that God would have us to do. With that being said, let's pick back up with Watchman Nee. Now let us take first the field of political science. The Old Testament history of Israel affords us the example of a highly privileged nation and its government. The people of Israel, we are told, wanted to be on equal terms with the nations around them. That still plagues Israel to this day. And not only Israel, but the people of God. We want to be like the nations around us, as opposed to being a simple people, a people who understand the danger that lies in connecting ourselves with this world. Well, Israel wanted this so much, they set their heart on a king. We will leave aside for the moment their election of Saul. And let us move on to the point where eventually, in his own time, God gave them the king of their choice, who would establish the king under his own direction. Now, even when this clearly was God's doing, the natural trend of this kingdom proved to be like the other nations away from God. For a kingdom is a worldly thing, and in keeping with all worldly things, it tends to come into collision with the divine purpose. 
Wherever in the world a nation's government is left to itself, it follows its natural course, which is further and further away from God. And we can truly see that here in America. So let me read that again. Wherever in the world a nation's government is left to itself, it follows its natural course, which takes it further and further away from God. And what is true in secular national politics worked itself out equally surely even in divinely chosen Israel. Whenever God discontinued his specific acts on their behalf, the kingdom of Israel drifted into idolatrous political alignments. There were recoveries, it is true, but everyone was marked by a definite divine intervention. And without such intervention, the trend was always downhill. It will scarcely surprise us that the same thing proves to be true in the field of commerce. I can think of no sphere where the temptation to dishonest and corrupt dealing is so great as here. We all know something of this. We all know how hard it is to remain straight and to conduct affairs honestly in the competitive world of trade. Many would say that it is impossible, and certainly to do so calls for a life that is cast upon God in a very unusual way. We recall that our Lord Jesus tells us of two contrasting men, one who gained the whole world and forfeited his life, and another, a merchant, who went and sold all that he had to buy one priceless pearl. To the latter of these, Jesus likened the kingdom of heaven. See Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, chapter 13, verse 45 and 46 for further explanation. The Spirit of God has not infrequently moved men in business to action of a like character. There have been not a few well-known business firms whose profits have been turned over to divine ends in the spread of the gospel and in other ways. I think of one such enterprise that at the outset of its history was the creation of a God-fearing businessman. Now, godly fear is a quality that can exist only as it is sustained from heaven. But business acumen and the efficient organization which it creates can be self-perpetuating. In the first generation of this firm's history, we find divine life being mediated through its founder sufficient to hold what was even then a worldly concern securely under the authority of God. But by the second generation, that restraint was gone. And as one would expect, the business gravitated automatically into the world system. Godly fear had drained away, but the firm itself is still flourishing. That kind of sounds like Walmart, don't it? Suppose we take now so apparently innocent a matter as agriculture. Here, Genesis, written in a primitive world of flocks and husbandry or farming, has something to tell us. After Adam's fall, God was compelled to say to Adam, Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In toil shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. No one would suggest that in Eden, where the tree of life flourished, farming or gardening was wrong. It was God appointed. But as soon as it was let go from under the hand of God, it deteriorated. Man was condemned to an endless round of drudgery and disappointment, and an element of perversity marked the fruit of his toil. The deliverance of Noah was God's great recovery movement, in which the earth was given a fresh start. But how swift, how tragic was man's reversion to type. Noah began, we are told, to be a husbandman or a farmer, and he planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine, and he became drunk, and he was uncovered within his tent. You'll find this in Genesis chapter 9, verse 20 and 21. Of course, 
agriculture is not in itself sinful. But here already its direction is away from God. Just let it follow its natural tendency and it will contrive to take a course diametrically opposed to him. Let me insert here what Watchman Nee is insinuating, and I would have to agree, is that in the Garden of Eden before man was cast out, they could eat the fruit of the vine without becoming intoxicated. But once cast out of the Garden of Eden and the vine took on its natural order, man found pleasure in the vine as opposed to pleasure in God. Back to Watchman Nee. Do we know something of this today in such physical disasters as the drying out of continents? How different is the church, God's husbandry? Through the grace of God and the indwelling spirit, she, the church, possesses an inherent life, power capable, if she responds to it, of keeping her constantly moving Godward or of recalling her Godward if she strays. When we turn to education, both the Bible and experience have something to say to us. Speaking allegorically, we might say that in rejecting Saul and choosing David as king, God was passing over a man distinguished by his head, for the Bible says that Saul was taller than all his peers, and yet God chose David, a wee little boy, a man after his own heart. That reminds me of what Jesus said. What is highly esteemed among men is an abomination unto God. Saul was an abomination, but David was highly esteemed by God. But more seriously, the men such as Joseph and Moses and Daniel, of whose wisdom God made public use, each received in a direct way from God himself the understanding they needed. They took little account of their secular education. And the Apostle Paul clearly placed scholarship among the all things that he counted to be lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus his Lord. You'll read of this in Philippians chapter 3 verse 8. Paul draws a clear distinction between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom that comes from God. For further insight, see 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 and verse 30. But it is experience that demonstrates the essential worldliness of scholarship as such. Most of the historic university colleges of the West were founded by Christian men with the desire to provide their fellows with a good education under Christian influence. During their founder's lifetime, the tone of those foundations was high because these men put real spiritual content into them. When, however, the men themselves passed away, the spiritual control passed away too, and education followed its inevitable course toward the world of materialism and away from God. In some cases, it may have taken a long time. For religious tradition dies hard, but the tendency has always been obvious, and in most cases, the destination has by now been reached. When material things are under spiritual control, they fulfill their proper subordinate role. Released from that restraint, they manifest very quickly the power that lies behind them. Let's read that one more time. When material things are under spiritual control, they fulfill their proper subordinate role. Released, however, from that restraint, they manifest very quickly the power that lies behind them. The law of their nature asserts itself, and their worldly character is proved by the course they take. The spread of missionary enterprise in our present era gives us an opportunity to test this principle in the religious institutions of our day and of our land. Over a century ago, the church set out to establish in China schools and hospitals with a definite spiritual tone and an evangelistic objective. In those early days, not much importance was attached to the buildings. 
while considerable emphasis was placed on the institution's role in the proclamation of the gospel. 10 or 15 years ago, you could go over the same ground and in many places find much larger and finer institutions on those original sites, but compared with the earlier years, far fewer converts. And by today, many of those splendid schools and colleges have become purely educational centers, lacking in a truly evangelistic motive at all. While to an almost equal extent, many of the hospitals exist now solely as places merely of physical and no longer of spiritual healing. The men who initiated them had, by their close walk with God, held these institutions steadfastly into his purpose. But when they passed away, the institutions themselves quickly gravitated toward worldly standards and goals, and in doing so, classified themselves as things of the world. But we should not be surprised by this. In the early chapter of the Acts, we read how a contingency arose which led the church to institute relief for the poor saints. That urgent institution of social service was clearly blessed by God, but it was of a temporary nature. Do you exclaim, how good if it had continued? Only one who does not know God would say that. Had those relief measures been prolonged indefinitely, they would certainly have veered in the direction of the world. Once the spiritual influence at work in their inception was removed, it would have been inevitable and impossible for them to do otherwise. For there is a distinction between the church of God's building on the one hand and on the other those valuable social and charitable byproducts that are thrown off by it from time to time through the faith and vision of its members. The latter, for all their origin in spiritual vision, possess in themselves a power of independent survival which the church of God does not have. They are works which the faith of God's children may initiate and pioneer, but which, once the way has been shown and the professional standards set, can be readily sustained or imitated by men of the world quite apart from the faith. The church of God, let me repeat, never ceases to be dependent upon the life of God for its maintenance. Imagine a living church in a city today with its fellowship and prayer and gospel witness and its many homes and centers of spiritual activity. Some years hence, what will we find? If God's people have followed him in faith and obedience, it may be a place filled more than ever with the life and light of the Lord and the power of his word. But if in unfaithfulness to him they have forsaken their vision of Christ, it may equally well have become a place where people preach atheism. By then, as a church, it will have ceased to exist. For the church depends for its very existence upon a ceaseless impartation of fresh life from God and cannot survive one day without it. But suppose alongside that church there is a school or hospital or publishing house or other religiously founded institution originating in the faith of the same church members. Assuming that the need for its service continues still to exist 10 years hence, and has not been met by some alternative private or state enterprise, then the probability is that that work will still be operating at no less efficient and commendable standard of service. For given ordinary administrative know-how, a college or a hospital can continue efficiently on a purely institutional level without any fresh influx of divine life. The vision may have gone, but the establishment carries on indefinitely. It has become no less worldly than everything else that can be maintained apart from the life of God. And every such thing is embraced in the Lord's sentence when he said, Now is the judgment of this world. 
Suppose I put to you the question, what work are you engaged in? And you answer medical work. You say that without any special consciousness other than the pride and the compassionate nature of your calling and without any sense of the possible danger of your situation. But if I tell you that medical science is one more unit of a system that is Satan controlled, what then? Assuming that as a Christian you take me seriously, then you are at once alarmed. And your reaction may even be to wonder if you had not better quit your profession. No, do not cease being a doctor, but walk softly, for you are upon territory that is governed by God's enemy. And unless you are on the watch, you are as liable as anyone else to fall prey to his devices. Or suppose you are involved in engineering, or farming, or publishing. Take heed, for these two are things of the world, just as much as running a place of entertainment or a hunt of vice. Unless you tread softly, you will be caught up somewhere in Satan's snares, and you will lose the liberty that is yours as a child of God. How then, you ask, are we to be delivered from his entanglements? Many think that to escape the world is a matter of consecration, of dedicating themselves anew and more wholeheartedly to the things of God. No, it is a matter of salvation. By nature, we are all entrapped in that satanic system, and we have no escape apart from the mercy of our Lord. All our consecration is powerless to deliver us. We are dependent absolutely dependent upon his compassion and upon his redemptive work alone to save us out of it. He is able to do so, and the means whereby he does it will be the theme of our next chapter. God can set us upon a rock, and he can keep our feet from slipping. Helped by him, we may turn our trade or profession to the service of his will for as long as he desires it. But let me repeat again that the natural trend of all the things that are in the world is towards Satan and away from God. Some of them have been set going by men of the spirit with the goal that is Godward. But as soon as the restraint of the divine life is removed from them, they automatically swerve around and take the other direction. No wonder then that Satan's eyes are ever on the world's end, and on the prospect that at that time all the things of the world will revert to him. Even now, and all the time, they are moving in his direction, away from God, and at the end time they may be expected to have reached their goal. As we touch any one of the units of his system, this thought should give us pause, lest we be found inadvertently helping to construct his kingdom. And that brings us to the end of chapter 2 today, friends. Next time, we'll pick up in chapter 3, which is titled, A World Under Water. Now, it is my prayer that the Lord Jesus will bless you and keep you, and that your journey will be one of great delight and great joy as you learn day by day what it means to truly follow Jesus and position your life in a place of surrender in all you say, all you think, and all you do. Now may the Lord Jesus be glorified in all things and especially through our lives as we represent him as faithful ambassadors here on earth. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.